Yeah, you too. So with that, I delayed long enough. <laughs> um, so I'm, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about slides and just a live demo after Laura. Uh, Laura Wright is the Assistant Director for Metadata Production at Cornell University and the convener of the Folio Metadata Management SIG Special Interest Group. So if you go into the Folio Wiki, there's lots of SIGs listed in a wiki based on area of interest for Folio. She's the convener for the Metadata Management SIG. Uh, prior to being at Cornell, she was at the University of Colorado Boulder, right? That's right. Yep. Um, and uh, they started a little bit of interest into Folio there. That's where um, Laura got her beak wet, so to speak, and then chased it over to Cornell because Cornell's waist deep into, probably neck deep into Folio at this point. So that's where she's at, and that's what she's going to talk to us about. You good to go? I'm good to go. All right, take it away. Okay, fantastic. I can, I can see people in the corner, which is nice because it's a little odd to be talking to people and not be able to see them. Um, really great to be talking to you today. And I know that for you, it is November 12th, but it's, uh, it's still November 11th for me. <laughs> It's Monday evening, and if you're not a Doctor Who fan, this is uh, his time traveling machine that is conveniently described as a police call box. I feel like I'm time traveling just a bit here. Um, and we have also had some rain and snow recently, and that probably sounds very welcome to you compared to brush fires. So I, I just wanted to say, I hope everybody there is safe. And I hope your families are safe. Um, and I also might give you a little background about me, but I'd like to mention a little bit about who I am, why I'm talking to you about Folio. So as Mike said, I am the, uh, I'm, my job title here is Assistant Director for Metadata Production, which is basically a fancy way of saying cataloging. I'm responsible for overseeing the original and copy cataloging here. And for most of my more than 20 years in libraries, I've been a cataloger of some sort. I've worked with maps, serials, government documents, more serials, uh, ebooks. Um, I also did a lot of, in the past, did a lot of batch loading and managed load profiles. Uh, I think of myself as a cataloger who likes to meddle. And um, I applied for the job I have now for a number of reasons, including the opportunity to work with some amazing colleagues here, but also the opportunity to stay engaged with and become even more engaged with Folio. Uh, so Cornell will be going live with the Folio ERM suite of apps in January of 2020. And that's just a few months away. And the rest of our, yes. <laughs> and the rest of our implementation implementation is going to be in July of 2021 when we will do a full migration. And I wanted to, to apologize in general, when I say we in an unqualified way, I'm talking about the Folio community and usually the metadata management community. I've been a part of the Folio community a lot longer than I've been part of Cornell. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about sort of the big picture of Folio in general, philosophically and practically. And then I'll talk some about the inventory app, which is one of the important apps in the meta metadata ecosystem. So, but first why open source? And these are some of the words that come to mind for me when I think of the value of and the motivation be behind open source tools. The open source connects to a number of the stated core values of the American Library Association, including sustainability, diversity, and public good. Open source also opens up the possibility of developing and sharing new tools and new ways of approaching our work. And the way I see it, our work has changed on the surface and will continue to change. And we need to respond to these changes in order to continue to do the work that we have always done, which is providing access to resources. So with open source projects come communities, which not only support the development of the tools, but help us better define our work and our workflows. So for instance, I have learned coincidentally while working with the metadata management special interest group 
some of the ways the German libraries have adopted and implemented RDA elements that are very different from what we've done in the US. And that's been really elucidating to me. And finally, open source is sustainable because it can continue to develop to meet our changing needs. The open source is obviously not a magic wand or a panacea, but it is a really good alternative to commercial models which have not necessarily proven to meet our needs and are not always aligned with our values. So why Folio in particular? Um, the microservices model was what first caught the attention of the former head of libraries IT at the University of Colorado Boulder, which is where I first learned about and got involved with Folio. So, as I mentioned, I'm a cataloger. I'm not a systems librarian, um, but I've still experienced the problems that come from the ILS being a huge relational database, really. Uh, for an extreme example is I once had to stop for loading records for six weeks because every time we loaded a record with the phrase United States in it, our entire system ground to a halt and crashed. And uh, we were a regional federal depository, so we had a lot of records with your United States. It turned out it was an indexing problem. It was fixed. But I realized at that point, OK, this monolithic relational database has some uh, has some downsides. So one of the things that excited me from the outset was the development based on needs articulated by subject matter experts in the form of user stories. In the SIG meetings, we often disagree vehemently about some details, and this makes us even more attuned to what we really need our tools to do. So I won't lie, it can be very frustrating. We are a group of passionate people, and our disagreements can be laborious at times. But sometimes we change each other's minds. And either way, I really prefer this sort of open discussion of what do we really need and want our tools to do to being told by a vendor what I should or shouldn't want. Um, a folio as a collaboration among a number of different libraries and multiple vendors is unique in its scale. So just as the subject matter experts often disagree, different members of the folio community often disagree. And these disagreements, while not always enjoyable, force us to scrutinize and articulate our needs and help us, I think, in the long run, develop a better sense of tools. And finally, very importantly to me as a cataloger, Folio is being built to accommodate not just the data we have now, but the data we will create and use in the future. So these four apps, Inventory, Data Import, Data Export, and MarkCat are the main apps that the Metadata Management Special Interest Group has been primarily focused on. This is a snippet from the Cornell Folio Sandbox. It's the data C release. So you'll see data import there and inventory. MarkCat is not yet integrated into Folio, but they're working hard on it. And data export is actually just beginning its development. Um, and if you are interested in data import and or data export, the next Folio forum will be focused on those apps. Uh, those forums are always recorded and they're available on YouTube. If you register for that forum, whether you attend or not, you'll get an email with a link to the recording, which makes it really easy. And I've got some information about that at the end of the presentation, if anyone wants more information about signing up for that or past forums. Uh, so I won't be talking about data import and data export today, but I'm really excited about how data import in particular is being configured. I think it's going to be very user friendly and flexible. So in the next few slides, I'm going to go into some more detail about inventory and how it will integrate with MarkCat and external cataloging utilities. So what is inventory? In order to explain what inventory is, I think it's helpful to start with what inventory is not. So inventory is not Folio's cataloging module. That took a little while for a lot of us catalogers to get used to. Inventory is not based on Mark. And inventory is also not the source of bibliographic data for discovery. 
all of these are, were really new to me at least and uh, took a while for me to get used to. So this is excerpted, excerpted from a document that we excerpted to put up on the tips and tricks page. Um, we were trying to define, well, what is inventory? So we said inventory is the folio app where bibliographic information from a variety of sources can be pre presented in a uniform abstracted form for management of the collection, regardless of the format or content rules used to describe a resource. So a little less abstractly, inventory can be described as a staff discovery layer. It holds the collection and integrates with apps like orders, check-in, check-out, and requests. Inventory exists primarily to manage collections, both physical or virtual. Libraries can choose which, if any, electronic content they want represented in inventory or not because inventory plus e-holdings can be searched together in the codex search for a more comprehensive view of collections. <coughs> so inventory will support holdings and item management. So items will enable circulation and requests. It will also be integrated with orders. Holdings and items from inventory will also be integrated with richer bibliographic metadata, such as MARC records, to inform patron basic discovery. And the cataloging, if that's in MARC or in other metadata formats, will happen in other apps. The app being developed and integrated with Folio currently is called MarcCat, but MARC editing can also take place entirely outside of Folio as well. So, for example, many US libraries do original cataloging primarily in OCLC, the Online Computer Library Center, I think is what that used to stand for. And those records can be pulled into what we call source record storage in Folio. And then they will be mapped to the inventory instance data, and they can be mapped also to patron facing discovery. At Cornell, we currently use Blacklight. For discovery and we plan to continue to do that after our migration to folio so in theory our user inter experience should not change noticeably um, institutions using an ILS with an integrated OPAC might have to make some bigger adjustments I was thinking about this and realizing that my just my personal experience having moved from an institution that was using an integrated OPAC to here at Cornell with the black light is that open source tools like Blacklight or Viewfind really make a much better patron experience. So this, there's a lot of information to take in here and please don't try to read the details. If you want to come back to this, you can. Um, what I wanted to point out is if you look at sort of the purplish, pinkish, yellowish, and orangish boxes, this demonstrates the interaction among the inventory, which is on the left in the orange, the source record storage in the middle, the yellow, and then mark cat. And we envision in the future, maybe there will be a bib, a bib frame cat or a Dublin core cat, or maybe even an EAD cat if somebody wanted to put EAD, if someone wasn't using something else to edit their EAD. And then if you are really overly observant, you might notice something additional on the far left, and that is this thing called a container record. CRUD, by the way, if you don't know, stands for Create, Read, Update, Delete. Uh, so the container record is not part of the current release, uh, but it's something that we still plan to develop, and it's a way to address non-bibliographic relationships between or among instances, for example, standing orders for monographic series and this container record type came out of it was originally the package element in the bib frame model we renamed it because we wanted to avoid confusion with the package in um, e-resource land um, and a, so a, an e-resource package is really just one possible type of container 
And the container is envisioned as a way to make these relationships more explicit, both for humans and for the system itself. Uh, since none of us have records like this right now in our current systems, none of us have data we need to migrate directly into this, this development has been put on the back burner while we identify and address more pressing needs for implementing libraries. But I am looking forward to having more flexibility like this in the future. So what does inventory look like? Just realized that something's, I missed a, nope, I just flipped a piece of paper over, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to be showing you screenshots here. I am always tempted to do live demos, but I don't want to uh, tempt fate with trying to switch between different screens and get distracted by doing searches and typing badly. And also, I know Mike is going to do some live demos for you uh, later. So I'll be sticking to screenshots, but all of these screenshots were taken within the last few days. Um, and this is from the index data stable snapshot. It's updated daily. And there's a link to this on the main folio wiki. It includes login information. Um, anyone can get into this environment and play around with it. I will be showing some examples from this stable snapshot and also some from the Cornell Sandbox, which has a slightly different, it's a slightly earlier version of Filio, so you can see how much development has happened really in the last month or two. Um, but first, I have a confession, and that is I didn't, until last week, I did not realize what the icon there, that little brown thing for inventory represented. I'm notoriously really bad with images. So I asked a coworker and she looked at it for a few seconds and said, it's a card catalog drawer. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I really wanted to point out here, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Oh, great. Okay, so over here on the left, under search and filter and the left pane, we have these three segments for the three record types, instance, holdings, and item. And these instance, holdings, item records are roughly based on the bib frame data model. And right now, I was about to click on this, it's a screenshot. Right now, right now, the search has developed for instance, if you click on holdings and items, there are just some placeholders there. But the idea is that we really want to be able to filter by different, different values, different information for each of those types of records. And this will be a, a more elegant way to do that. So that's right now, as I said, you can't, you can't see the item filters, but they are going to be item level information like material type rather than instance level. And so not only is this going to give us better searching, but it's going to look a lot like other apps. And this consistency, this is the orders app that has those same, seg same segments. And this consistency across apps is important in the community it's good for the user experience and it's also good for development because once we have these existing components, they can easily be adapted and reused. So this screenshot is from the Cornell Sandbox. The top is cut off. It really does have that top bar, but um, you can see this has a this was what search and filter used to look like before we got those segments in there. And I think those segments just went in a few weeks ago. So we're, things are happening very quickly. Uh, so this is a, an earlier version, but oh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a little cut off. Wanted to show, um, this is the Cornell Sandbox, and these are our, this is, I think we have about 4,000 record, records in here. These are actual data, and I love coming in here and looking because I can play with them and I compare, can compare them to our current um, public catalog display. So in this search, what I had done was limited to all of our rare and manuscript collection locations, but I did a bad screenshot so you can't see that on the left. So one thing we spent a lot of time a couple of years ago 
in the metadata management SIG talking about how we wanted to define resource type versus format type versus material type. And systems that I've worked with in the past tend to sort of mush together a lot of aspects like mode of issuance or seriality content format into maybe one field. And the resources that we collect and describe don't really conform to those neat categories. Something, and I've worked, I've worked with things like this, that it might be a map that is also issued as part of a series and it might be on CD-ROM. Um, so, more than one system system that I've worked with has made these kinds of categories mutually exclusive. It could be a map or it could be on CD-ROM, but it could be both. And that leads to reasonable people limiting searches in ways that actually exclude useful results. Uh, since Folio is an international community, we decided to adhere wherever possible to international standards. And what we finally decided is that resource type corresponds roughly to the RDA element content type. Um, but Folio allows individual tenants to also add locally defined resource type values in addition to those that are taken from the RDA content type vocabulary. So if you speak MARC, uh, the content type is what you find in the 336 field. And this I filtered for cartographic image, which is also known as a map. And then the format type we decided to make correspond to a sort of a combination of RDA media type and carrier type. Um, and once again, we have those standard vocabularies that are international and then you can add local values as well. And if if you speak MARC, those are the 337 and the 338 fields. Material type, we decided, was really an item-specific value. So it's, just, it's assigned at the item level rather than at the instance level. And unlike resource and format type, it's not a controlled vocabulary. So this is where you can use whatever common terminology makes sense to you and your users at whatever level of granularity you need. So if you want to lump all your microfiche, microfilm, and microcards together and call them microform, you can. If you want to give them each a very specific material type, you can. If you want to distinguish between a large umbrella and a small umbrella, you can. And we actually do circulate umbrellas here at Cornell. It rains a lot. So this is a view of the settings app and this is what it looks like where if you wanted to say add some values some local values for formats there's a table here that you can add to and same thing for material types and these are actually i think i'm trying to remember Who's whose instance? Oh no, this is the uh, this is the uh, snapshot stable material types. I should have uh, gone in and seen what we have assigned for ours. Okay, so another really pretty recent development is some of the settings for what we call HR IDs, which are the human readable IDs. And these are the numbers we'll use to identify records. Each record will actually have a UUID, but if you've seen those, they're very long. They're something you don't even want to copy and paste, much less type out. So the HRIDs will allow us to refer specifically to record numbers, but in ways humans can deal with. Um, and this is from the settings, and this is showing that we'll be able to do some configuring of how the HRIDs are assigned sequentially. And that might sound pretty boring, but what this means is we are going to be able, when we first migrate, we're going to be able to, we're going to have the option to keep our existing record numbers from our previous system. And that's important here at least because we've often used those system record numbers in, for instance, a URL when we've digitized something. 
And we don't want to have to go through and change all of those. So we'll be able to keep existing numbers and then set a higher number for folio to start at. And from then on, just have sequentially assigned numbers. So this ability to configure this here is new and exciting to me. And another, another very recent change to the user interface is the order of records that is displayed that are displayed in the detail pane on the right in inventory. So you can see here, this is an instance record. And at the top, we have holdings and associated items. And underneath that, we start having the instance data. And so until a few weeks ago, it actually looked like this. This is the bottom of the record. Uh, very bottom, so you have to scroll way down for holdings and items. Uh, so we actually proposed and made this change in response to concerns for, for from the resource access people who are people concerned with things like circulation. And we were sort of talking about it as a compromise from the metadata perspective. And now that we've done it, I don't know why we didn't do this all along, because I think it's a lot easier to get a just a good picture of the summary of what's going on this way. So, so I'm actually quite happy about that. Me too, Lord. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay, so one, one more little feature I just wanted to point out, and I don't know if you were going to demo this, Mike, but I love this. Um, so there's this little clipboard icon next to the barcode for an item. If you click on it, um, and this uh, this message is actually new as of I think last week. Um, that you click on that little clipboard and it copies the barcode, so you don't need to select it. Just click on it, and that's really helpful if you're going from one app to another. Say you're in inventory and you want to go to circulation and check something out. It makes life a lot easier. So as promised, here's some information about that upcoming forum, which is in the US, it's on November 20th, which means it is, it would be, that's well, probably in the middle of the night for you, isn't it? Um, but as I said, these are, the forums are all recorded and if you read you can register and not sign in and then you get a link to it uh, this registration link is awful so i made a little tiny url for it but you can also just go to the main folio wiki which is wiki.folio.org and you scroll just a little bit down on that page under folio forum webinars you can find a link to register to this one you can find information about past webinars and recordings or links to recordings of past webinars. On that, I always have to include some dogs. <laughs> and I would be happy to take questions or hear comments. Any questions for more? I think that's it, Laura. All right. I think we're good. Thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.